Hello everyone. My name is Mary Samuel. I work with the HSC National Health and Social Care Professions Office. You're very welcome to the second webinar hosted by the HSC HSCP Office in collaboration with the RCSI Institute of Leadership. I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to continue our discussions on the theme of HSCP leadership in practice during COVID-19. In today's session, we are going to focus on the area of e-health. Since March 2020, the way we deliver our services has changed. We have had to adapt to a very complex environment, reduce the amount of services delivered face-to-face -face, and adhere to new infection prevention and control guidelines. This has also given us the opportunity to embrace technology and look at new ways of working. To discuss this in depth, we are joined by an expert panel of members, Jackie Reed, National Lead of the National HSCP Office, Murray Byrne, Telehealth Project Officer in the National HSCP Office, and Health Informatics Lead, Scope in St. James's Hospital, Blanet Coveney, Senior Musculoskeletal Physiotherapist working in primary care in Dunleary and in Dublin Southeast, Anne Barrett, Acting Senior Speech and Language Therapist with the Cork Early Supported Discharge for Stroke. Thank you, panel, for joining us today. I would now like to hand over to Jackie. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, and a very warm welcome and a thank you to our panelists for me too. I'm really looking forward to chatting with you today. So uh, first of all, I'm going to come to you, Marie. Um, we know that you work in St. James's Hospital and that one of the first COVID patients was admitted to, to St. James's. And we also know that you were in a position to very rapidly adopt um, telehealth there. I'm wondering, could you tell us a little bit about what happened in, in March and what you already had in place in St. James's that enabled such a rapid um, adoption? Thanks, Jackie. So in March, um, on March 13th, I was in my office, which is based in the IT department in St. James's Hospital. Um, and my office is directly across the corridor from the director of informatics. And she knew that we had telehealth on our agenda for the work plan. So um, she popped her head into the office and she said, um, Marie, I have um, a vendor here who's showing a vid video enabled care solution. Would you like to come and have a look? And can you bring in some of your um, colleagues? So I got on the WhatsApp group and we, um, within 15 minutes, one of the physios was over and followed shortly, very quickly by the clinical nutritionist and then two of the OTs. So we all had a look at this product and what impressed me most, I guess, was the, the patient focus again. Um, the physio was very quick to say, I'll dial in as a patient. I go down the corridor, pretend I'm a patient. And then she was looking at the, the solution from the point of view of, oh, I have a sore foot. How would I show the physio my foot? And would there be any mobility issues with showing my foot on the phone? And um, just very impressive. So I went on, on leave for a week and um, they decided to take that solution on board in James's and the, one of the physio managers was very um, proactive in getting licenses set up, um, looking at the workflow for the patients, the, all the logistics. They had a patient leaflet done up in, in a matter of weeks. So they really rapidly did adopt the, the solution. Um, and your, the second part of your question, Jackie, I suppose, is why do I think that was the case? I guess me being based in the IT department was one of the things, and we've been over there pretty much since 2001 off and on, um, doing projects or else being the li liaison person. So really good relationships that built up with the IT department. They basically don't forget about scope or the HSCPs. Um, our HSCPs are, you know, they're digital savvy. But, you know, they know the language of digital. We have an EPR in James's, so it's it's in our blood in James's, I guess. Um, and they're not all tech savvy. There are some people it doesn't suit, but there are others who are a bit more tech savvy, tech savvy, I suppose, are willing to share. And during that time, they were doing sessions with each other to show each other how to do the various pieces. I suppose overall, they just have a very can-do attitude. And um, as well as that, they have... Um, a real 
um, background in quality improvement. So they don't just look as, at e-health as a, the solution. They look at what, what is the problem we're trying to solve? What are the needs here? Can e-health help us here? Um, how would we measure if that, um, you know, introduction of e-health was an actual um, change or an improvement rather than it just being tech for tech's sake? Um, there's some projects, I suppose, I'd like to highlight that were really fast in adopting. And I suppose the Opfit were one of those in physio, the speech and language therapist and the cleft service and the tracheostomy service. The dietitians did an awful lot on, um, you know, changing their services over to to telephone and video. Um, and they all just, I suppose, got on board OTs with the hand therapy service. Um, yeah, so I suppose it's a real can-do communications, lots of relationship building over many years. So, um, yeah, that's probably why it was quick to happen. Oh, that's that's really impressive. It's um, it's a rare thing that much happens when you go for a week's holidays. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's yeah. clearly a very can-do attitude there. I'm, I'm wondering, were there any challenges then um, that you and your colleagues might have encountered? despite your can-do attitude and, and all of the other groundwork that was in place? Yeah, absolutely, Jackie. The, um, I suppose we thought we had it on our agenda, but we had it as a, you know, that is something we will do in the future as opposed to we're ready to go today. And I suppose one of the things about that was we didn't have the necessary equipment. So we didn't have the headsets, we didn't have the webcams, speakers if needed. And I suppose headsets that are uh, Bluetooth or Wi-Fi enabled so that, and Wi-Fi enabled I should say so that you could move around while you're in a class so that was one thing and I suppose we didn't anticipate the digital literacy and digital divide issues that our patients might have um, we didn't also I suppose the space that you really do need a private space a lot of um, departments are set up that they're quite open but maybe curtains around but there isn't the actual side rooms to accommodate all of this. So they were probably the biggest challenges. Um, one of the other things I suppose is that it was a time of, as Mary said in her intro, a complex time in health and very stressful for everyone. And people had gone through a lot of change in the previous few years. And there was probably a certain amount of change fatigue. So people were like, oh, do we have to? But they knew in the end, they were thinking about their patients and maintaining services. And they very much went with it. Thanks, Marie. Um, and a very, very interesting, a very interesting journey, obviously, for, for all involved and, and, and challenging, clearly, for, for people. Um, was there particular learning that you would like to share with other people from, from that experience, both from the, the adoption and, and, and how people managed from both of those perspectives? Yeah, I guess um, getting to know your IT people is a really important thing. Um, just, you know, they're not just going to necessarily remember HSCP. So if you start to build links there, start to look at what other sites are doing, um, the clinical webinars that are happening at the moment by the virtual health team, that's a really good place to start um, to see what the learning is. I suppose if you're submitting business cases as a manager to consider, you know, um, equipment needs, not just the, the resources in terms of staffing, think about the, the, the resources for equipment as well. And I suppose just if posts in this area do come up to for HSCPs to consider those posts, I think sometimes they think it's beyond them, but it isn't. There's a lot of transferable skills that HSCP have in terms of problem solving, change management, it, it, just a different view. We're doing this problem solving thing every single day in our clinical work. So I suppose it's just consider that and also I suppose from a manager's point of view to seek out your who are your IT people or who are your IT nerds we call ourselves I suppose there's more of us now than there was ever was after the last few months but just seek out those people and use them as not use them is the wrong word but just um, use their skills and make the most of um, what they can give to the or their, your department um, I suppose just to highlight that there are some opportunities, there's the MSc in digital transformation and some springboard courses. UCD have started their master's back up as well. So, and it's funded by springboard. So there's lots of opportunities. And I, as I mentioned, the clinical webinars specifically to telehealth. So. 
Thank you very much, Marie. That's a that's a lot of information um, that you've you've shared with us today. Thank you for that. That I'm sure will really help others um, thinking about about adopting digital health who may be at different stages in the journey. So thank you so much. Thank you, Marie. I'm going to move over now to talk to Blonet, the community perspective. Blonet, I know that you're you're a muscular senior musculoskeletal physiotherapist in community. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing a little bit about the perspective from from working in the community side of things. I'm, I'm wondering, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the service where you work, um, the situation you found yourselves in and, and what triggered any changes that, that you made? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so I, I'm, my name is Blonid Coveney and I'm a physiotherapist working in uh, primary care in CHO6. And that's one of the nine uh, community health organisations nationally. Um, and it comprises three different areas. So it comprises Wicklow, Dunleary and Dublin South East. And the area has a, a large population, nearly uh, 400,000 people living in both urban and in rural areas, um, with our uh, Wicklow having nearly 35% of their population living in, in a rural setting. So. Across this area, there are nearly 60 physiotherapists in the community delivering services um, in a wide range of locations. So there's actually 27 different um, areas or locations that people are working from, each of those with their own um, network of connection capacity. Um, but also, I think the important thing to think is in primary care, it's different that you have and um, you're different from a hospital, perhaps where or a clinic where you would have all of your staff um, centrally located. Um, so we now have um, a large number of clinicians working out of a very large number of locations. So that in a way presents a unique set of challenges, I think, uh, to deliver the service ordinarily and uh, and obviously during the, this pandemic. So our, our project began really in response to, like everybody in response to the rapidly changing events in March, um, we found that our clinics were primary care centres were closed. Clients were unable to attend the clinics and um, even many clinicians were working from home, but still delivering services to to our clients. And so I think initially we were um, phoning clients and emailing exercises, um, delivering equipment and liaising with um, the clients and family and also colleagues. And we were at that time using uh, the phones initially, but we really were very keen to adapt and I suppose to explore the use of telehealth um, uh, video for delivering our service. So that's where our project emerged. Thanks, Blonde, for giving us a good, a good picture of your situation. Could you take us through um, a little bit about the steps that you took then? Sure. Yeah. I mean, in response, I suppose, to the to the situation, the first thing that happened was um, uh, a primary care telehealth working group um, was set up for physiotherapy in CHO6. It had representatives from all the areas and we discovered very quickly that there were um, differences in uh, each of the areas and in what platforms um, people were using. So people started quite quickly to adapt and to use different platforms. and. We discovered that um, Wicklow had blue eye very early on, like St. James's, and they were storming ahead with that. And um, DSE um, were using Attend Anywhere and um, Dunleary were using Salasso. And they were all using uh, WhatsApp at the time as a backup. Um, but the differences really in the um, usage depended on the availability, um, the connectivity as well, but also critically, I think the licenses, uh, depending on where they and um, who you know um, so there was a, a, a kind of a, a difference between the areas and then we figured there were all these different platforms being used there was a kind of um, an overload of information and not that much clarity I think and so um, we decided to create this kind of visual database that you could kind of look very easily and compare um, all of the as it turned out eight platforms at that stage um, and compared them um, across a, a kind of a large range of parameters. So initially we included um, Attend Anywhere, um, Blue Eye, WhatsApp, Salasso, which is an integrated telehealth and exercise platform, Zoom at the time early on, um, Skype and Microsoft Teams, and then laterally uh, Webex. So there was a lot, there were a lot of platforms and a lot of information. So we just kind of we put manners on it. We tried to get it into this database and 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 sort of get make some sense of it. Um, 
And one of, some of the things that we compared, I think, um, were really important. We wanted to see where whether some platforms were web-based or app-based. Did we have to have an app did, to log on? Did the client need an app? Um, what licenses were needed, um, if any? Um, ha critically, were they approved by the HSE? Um, and were they uh, were there security issues? So very quickly, we we found that Zoom kind of dropped off because of security issues and uh, uh, not being approved. Um, and then we looked at the the kind of the in depth hardware and software differences between those platforms, not just for us as clinicians, but also as uh, for the clients because they would have requirements um, to connect with us. Um, and I think lastly, then we the really important bit, I think, were advantages and, and disadvantages. And I mean, you, you could see quite quickly wh where certain advantages were. But what we wanted was a kind of a feedback, a kind of um, feedback by, by the people who were using the platforms. Um, so some real time experiences from our clinicians. So we, we asked those clinicians who were using specific platforms like our colleagues in, in Wicklow, and they were able to um, uh, access this document, to edit it, and it was shared. And so it was a kind of um, uh, a fluid living document in a way that was constantly edited. I'm, I'm still editing it. I was editing it the other day as things change, as uh, platforms improve and as they develop. So that's where where the project uh, came about. Thanks, Blana. That that sounds really really interesting. It's very interesting about being a living document. I, I'm wondering what was the impact on? Was there any impact on policy and practice, and staff coping with the change as a result of that work? Yeah, I think in in relation to policy, I mean the first thing that that strikes me is that how everything changed from an IT point of view. So initially, because of the of the nature of of primary care, we found there was a lack of conformity across the board, so that uh, there wasn't consistency in who had what. So there were differences in hardware and software. Um, but I found there was a really rapid upgrade in all of the IT that was provided. So new secure HSE laptops were, were provided for, for everybody, secure phones, uh, VPNs, so you could work securely from home. And I think it's really important is, you know, there are quite a few locum staff initially Normally, you wouldn't have a HSE phone or a laptop, but they're very kindly provided us, <laughs> me included, with a um, oh, with a HSE laptop. A VPN was provided so it could work from home if we needed to, um, and uh, and also for people working in areas where there were, I would say, network challenges. They um, um, over time, those challenges were reported, and they um, they were provided with MiFi wireless routers, which I think has helped somewhat. Uh, nothing is perfect in the network connection end, but I think it helped a little. The other areas would be staff training, so that that really everyone had opportunities to 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 uh, uh, to be routinely provided with training in all the platforms. There were telehealth champions. Um, those were fantastic kind of advocates for the platforms, encouraging people to um, log on and to, you know, it, log on, like Marie said, a, a call back and forth between you just to see how it works. Um, so that was a really uh, big improvement. I think how our meetings are conducted, even to this day now, all staff meetings are conducted using Teams. Um, any training or webinars, uh, we use Teams or it can be on WebEx. So there's a that's a that's a very big change uh, I think in terms of policy, and then we created a, a data collection tool which was uniform across all three areas. So we are collecting the same information, which up until then we haven't quite been, and um, that's a, a kind of feeds into our weekly stats that allows us to record not just usage but also connection issues, which I suppose um, helps us highlight needs for change. So from 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 the practice point of view, I think firstly, you know, delivering one on one care through telehealth across all these specialties was the first thing without doubt. But but then it's progressed in time to delivering groups, um, group classes delivered remotely. Um, so using, say, the likes of WebEx to deliver um, the Slauncha Care Living Well program and pulmonary rehab programs now being delivered and and a kind of a willingness for staff to look at how to develop group um, programs to deliver to people in the community who can't may, maybe still can't come in to, to see us. 
The other aspect of, of practice would be the staff working with IT companies or the telehealth companies themselves, which has been a real, um, really interesting for us and, and interesting how willing they are to work with us to develop their either exercise platforms or um, just a, to create a situation where it's easier for us to um, group call or to share screens. Um, and then in terms of um, just in terms of, of practice, the communication is improved between the areas, but also outside primary care. So we've liaised with our colleagues in Our Ladies of Lourdes and Drogheda, who very kindly helped us uh, give loads of advice on how they set up their pulmonary rehab programme. So I think communication is definitely improved. And then just in terms of staff, uh, I mean, you have to admire it. There, there are some, the upskilling is incredible. There are some people using six platforms in their weekly work. Um, and part of that is they have to have backups for network issues, but the flexibility is, is I think it's impressive. Um, the telehealth champions are there to, to kind of try and make sure that nobody is left behind if possible, because there are obviously different um, degrees of literacy, uh, digital literacy and confidence. Um, and I think notwithstanding, it is stressful for some people to use telehealth, even you know clinicians, some clinicians find it difficult and it's certainly not appropriate for all uh, for all patients. Thank you, Blanet. And lastly, just uh, is there any key learning nugget as you as you know in terms of where you're standing now that you'd that you'd you'd that you'd like to share with people? I've alluded to the to the the capacity for change in staff, but I think it's really interesting that the capacity for change in your clients. So often we would start on one platform, such as say WhatsApp, because if an older client might have WhatsApp, they would be confident to go onto that. And after they got confident with you and got to know you, the ability to um, for them to move over to another platform was really interesting. I thought that was a um, it, it gave them. Um, I suppose it it impressed in the capacity of the clients to adapt. Um, that you you can line everything up before, and you really do need many things to line up. But if you don't have network connectivity. Um, you know, you can have all the hardware and software in the world, but network connection issues are the things really that influences the patient's enthusiasm and even a, a willingness, I think, to participate. Um, and then just a couple of more things that platform developers, they don't exist in a vacuum. They need our help. And I think they're really um, open to, to help and open to discussions around that. And I suppose getting back to the digital literacy issues, not everybody is suitable for for uh, telehealth um, um, interactions. You know, you're always going to need to see clients face to face, but um, I do think it's going to remain as part of a kind of blended model of care uh, for clients in the future. Thank you very much, Blanet, for sharing all of that with us. Um, I'm now going to, to turn to the south of the country um, uh, to, to Anne Barrett. Acting Senior um, Speech and Language Therapist with the Early Supported Discharge Service. Um, and um, really looking forward to talking to you about your experiences there with your service um, in, term, in terms of e-health. So I'm, I'm wondering, can you tell us a little bit about your service and how you've, how you've adopted since COVID and how you're operating? Yeah, so prior to COVID-19, the Cork Early Supported Discharge Team our EST was an entirely home-based HSEP-led rehabilitation service um, and its aim is to bridge um, the journey for stroke survivors from hospital to home. Um, its aim is to provide earlier than usual discharge um, and rehabilitation in the familiar environment of the patient's own home. But um, in March, as the COVID-19 pandemic unfolded locally and nationally, face-to-face um, -face home visits were becoming a greater risk both to the, the, the stroke survivors, to their family and to the ESD team members. So we had to think on our feet um, and adapt. So, um, you know, minimising the risk of transmission while still supporting high quality rehabilitation was and is our goal. So with the support of our managers, the acute stroke team, the OOCIO and the National Stroke Programme, um, we faced into the unknown and embraced a virtual transformation. Um, and we asked our, our stroke survivors, our patients to engage and come with us on that journey. Um, you know, so this involved 
doing rehabilitation over video calling online platforms. Um, so this we were able to continue to give direct um, rehabilitation, so physical communication, cognitive and activities of daily rehabilitation, activities of daily living rehab um, continued through virtual means. So at present, we are offering a blend of tele-rehabilitation and some face-to-face -face as required. But it means that we can still offer the same intensity and quality of rehab in patients' own homes while reducing the risk of COVID-19. OK, so Anne, what were some of the factors that you had to consider when you were making this change in your services? So when adapting to a virtual service model, there were a number of factors to consider. And these are categorized by Dr. Kira Heaven in UCC. And she has categorized these into clinical, technical, and organizational factors. So an example of a clinical factor might be um, a patient's ability um, and suitability for virtual rehab. So defining key goals and the risk benefit of a virtual consultation versus a face-to-face -face consultation. Then an example of a technical factor would be having access to technical expertise or having reliable equipment. Then in terms of organisational factors, this would be identifying a tele-rehab champion to address the concerns and barriers experienced by staff. So sharing the knowledge and upskilling others in best practice. So another thing to consider is looking at your schedules and that would be another organizational factor it may require more communication and coordination than than traditional means um thanks Anne. um that that sounds like a lot you had to consider and i'm just wondering you know how can you tell us a bit about how you went about leading that change and and um developing the cohesion that must have been needed for for all of the different parties there yeah, so from the outset, we had the shared goal of patient centred care and shared ownership for change. So we were very fortunate to have wonderful support from our acute hospital colleagues, from our HSEP line managers, from local IT and from o the OOCIO, to name but a few. So, so this was really key, having their support, but also communicating with each other and sharing ideas and learning was really important. And um, also adopting a culture of no blame, open and honest feedback as to how it was going and sharing our learning as we went was essential in, in developing the service and to driving it forward. Um, so I suppose developing our knowledge base and competency was also facilitated by delegating tasks. So this may be looking at the evidence base or having designated responsibility for adapting policies and procedures or making documentation accessible for those with technology or communication difficulties to allow them to access their virtual rehab. Um, so again, just keeping in mind the shared goal that it was for patient centred care and identifying patients who were suitable while still acknowledging that we aim to deliver a high quality service and reducing the risk of COVID-19. And at times we had to accept that the risk, um, that not everybody is suitable, but in the context of COVID-19, it was the best available alternative. And with that in mind, we spoke and engaged with our acute and community colleagues to ensure the transition for those patients was smooth. So this was things like working on our schedules together, um, you know, delegating things like patient consent, weekly meetings and correspondence was important too. And listening to the voices of others and to their concerns was, um, as we problem solved together, was key. Uh, what was it like for staff then, you know, uh, going through all of those changes? Um... So it really did push us outside of our comfort zones. And initially it does require more planning and more work when you prepare for your sessions or adapt your materials. And in the summer, it would have been easier for us to revert back to our face to face, the, the traditional way that we knew. But now, as we're facing into another wave of COVID, um, we're fortunate that we are, have maintained the service, that we've maintained our skills and upskilled others. So really, um, service delivery has been largely uninterrupted and it has facilitated discharge from hospital. And um, so I suppose as we are developing the skills, we're, for us, we're continuing to continuing to develop and to refine those skills further. 
It's fantastic. And how are you, how are you, um, you know, sharing this at a national or a wider level, you know, with, with colleagues nationally? So from the outset, we engaged cross collaboration across sectors. So within the HSE, the voluntary sector um, and the universities, um, both locally and in, uh, nationally and internationally, clinicians and academics alike. So this involved conference calls with the national ESD team and with support from the National Stroke Programme. Um, we developed and, and used a shared folder to share resources and this encouraged discussion, collaboration and information sharing between teams. Um, and equally, international collaborations were established with, a stroke, with stroke rehabilitation services in the UK. And this resulted in the development of a joint UK and Ireland collaborative statement on the rationale for maintaining the ESD teams during the COVID-19 outbreak. Um, and at present, we're currently conducting research with Dr. Irene Hartigan in UCC, and this is exploring the service user experience of ESD during the COVID-19 pandemic. And we plan to, to publish these results once the data analysis is complete. Um, I suppose because for us, it's vital to reflect and evaluate the efficacy and effectiveness of tele-rehabilitation in the Irish context, and also to, do, to drive research into the long-term health, financial, and the societal impact and benefits of it. So I suppose we need to be confident in its efficacy um, in terms of safe care and also reducing disability and wellness recovery so that we can progress the tele-rehabilitation beyond just this COVID-19 pandemic. Thanks, Anne. I'm really looking forward to, to reading that when it's published and to, and, and to seeing the outcomes. Um, just finally to, to ask you, you know, now as you reflect back, like what are the key messages or key takeaways that you would like to share with, with anybody who's, who's listening to, to this webinar? Yeah, so I suppose persistence is key. At times it was challenging and sometimes we have to sit with acknowledging it wasn't for everyone or for every patient, but capitalising and, and identifying those patients who it is suitable for and working with them. So I suppose with that in mind, it was it's important to balance safety and ensuring quality, and, and that is really important. And I can't emphasise more the importance and benefits of sharing information and building relationships with others. That has, has been really, really invaluable. Well, thank you very much, Anne, for sharing that with us. I'm now going to hand back to Mary. Thank you, Jackie. I would now like to take the opportunity to thank the panel members for sharing their experiences and learning. To summarize, I would like to highlight the key points discussed by each of our panel members that align with leadership skills, specifically demonstrating leadership being put into practice. Murray has highlighted the importance of being an early adopter, especially when technology enables us to provide more person-centered services. We also have here a great example of role flexibility and transferable skills that we have among HSCPs and how important it is to be future focused. What we learn from Blarned is the power of information and data in challenging times, why we need feedback to inform our decision making. It also highlights for us the importance of developing and maintaining key stakeholders and relationships, and reminds us of the impact effective teams have on patient-centered care, how we share best practice within our organizations and influence service improvement nationally and internationally. A sincere thanks to Ms. Tina Joyce from RCSI for her expert advice in all areas we needed help and support to make this webinar a reality. Our thanks to Suzanne and Miriam from the RCSI operational and technical teams respectively. Our next webinar will focus on clinical leadership demonstrated by some of our HSCP colleagues. Please refer to the slide for our contact details. We look forward to you joining us at the next webinar. Thank you.